Okay, I guess since we're recording, it's time for me to get started. Dr. Miller, let me introduce you first, okay, okay and say, say a few right. um, introductory, introductory statements. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Margaret Lynn, Director of Clinical Research Development at the Tennessee Clinical and Translational Science Institute at UTHSC, and I, along with Dorita Brand, Director of Administration, want to welcome you to Research 103. And the goal of this six-part series is to provide advanced information for research study conduct. Research 103 follows 101 and 102, which were offered in the spring and fall of 2020. And if you weren't able to attend those sessions, those recordings are available on our website. So you can go to the search engine of UTHSC and enter Research 101 or 102 to find them. Alternatively, you may always email me at m, as in Margaret, l-y-n-n at uthsc.edu. Um, we're also recording 103, uh, and those sessions will be available on the website soon, and we'll send out an announcement. I want to thank UTHSC IT department for all of your help. Thank you, Xavier and Roger. They're co-piloting us today. Um, during these Zoom lectures, your microphone has been muted. You, you can use the Q&A uh, function to ask questions, and those will be asked at the end of the session. If there's any kind of technical difficulty we'll, and we can't correct it, we'll notify you of uh, the content of this session um, on our website. Um, after the, after the uh, session today, you'll receive an evaluation by email. Um, be looking for that. Within about 10 business days, you'll be able to download your certificate for CEUs. Um, Dorita Brand and I have no real or apparent financial disclosures. Today is our last session of Research 103, and at the conclusion, Dorita will tell you about our principal investigator training series that will begin next week. So today's session is scientific integrity and in preventing research misconduct, and our speaker is Dr. Mark Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller has been a basic science researcher since 1986 and has been the UTHSC Research Integrity Officer for the past three years. He was a member of the UTHSC Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee for one year and was the chair of the UTHSC Institutional Biosafety Committee for eight years. He is currently the UTHSC Research Integrity Officer, and he is an Associate Professor in the College of Medicine, Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Biochemistry. Thank you, Dr. Miller, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. All right. <clears throat> okay, so the, the session objectives for today are to describe the clinical aspects of research integrity explain what constitutes research misconduct, and to evaluate strategies for prevention of research misconduct. And so here's the, the overview follows that almost directly. So we'll ask these three questions as we go along. What is research integrity or scientific integrity? What constitutes research misconduct? And how can research misconduct be prevented? And that's, a, that's an interesting question. Okay, so first off, the National Academy on being a scientist, the scientific research enterprise, like other human activities, is built on a foundation of trust. Scientists trust that the results reported by others are valid. Society trusts that the results of the research reflect an honest attempt by a scientist to describe the world accurately and without bias. And this is, it's critical that the scientific record be accurate. Because without that, there is distrust of, of science and of scientific results, of treatments. Um, right now, we're seeing that with, with the COVID vaccine. And so it's, it's of paramount importance to all of us as scientists uh, to make sure that the scientific record is accurate. Okay, so what does responsible conduct of research look like? Um, there are different practices. It depends on what field that you're of study that you're in, but all of these fields, um, there are shared values, honesty, accuracy, efficiency, and objectivity. Um, honesty and accuracy are, are critical. You know, um, you've got to convey research results truthfully and report them precisely. Uh, efficiency, this has become more and more important because there are Using resources wisely is really critical now. There's a 
there's not much there's the amount of research dollars available is less than it's been in the past and efficiency is key objectivity is probably the most important aspect of that this you have to let the facts speak for themselves and avoid your personal biases when you're doing and reporting research okay so what constitutes research integrity and this is a this is a really broad topic i'm going to give you a the the main points i think here we'll talk collaboration ethics certainly when when investigators collaborate together it's critical that they do that in an upfront and honest way and very often that doesn't happen um, communication between collaborators is key um, and this is key to avoid um, data integrity issues it's key to avoid authorship to avoid authorship disputes it's important to, to uh, for efficient research to take place. Mentorship is a key point of integrity for researchers. If you're a principal investigator and you take graduate students or postdocs, it's key that you take that as a, as a real responsibility and mentor those people, teach them to do research in an effective way, but also in an ethical way. And prepare them so that they will become effective scientists when they leave your lab. That is a, a key component of research integrity. Peer review is incredibly important to the conduct of science. When you're asked to review a paper, um, your, your job is to make sure that, that the authors have interpreted their data correctly and, and in a proper way. And it's important for you to do that in a very unbiased fashion. You're usually going to be asked to review papers that, and grants, for that matter, that are in your area of study because you're a content expert. And there are, you know, you may have biases. These are competitors of yours that are submitting these grants and papers. You've got to put that aside and be honest with your peer review. It's really a critical component to research integrity. Managing your conflicts of interest is a critical part of this. And that, you know, we just talked about one incidence of that peer review. You've got to manage your conflicts of interest when you're reviewing other people's uh, work. But you also have to manage your conflict of interest in your own research. You may have financial interest depending on the outcome of your research. You can't allow that to drive uh, incorrect data reporting. Biosecurity is, is critical. That's critical for trust between investigators and the public. Uh, same with social responsibility. We have important social responsibilities as, as scientists. And if we don't live up to those, uh, the impact of that can be long lived and devastating. Now we've come to publication ethics and authorship. I'm gonna talk a little more about that. Um, here, so researchers do have responsibilities related to publication of their findings. Obviously, the, the findings have to be reported correctly, but each author on a paper must be allowed to review and approve the final draft of the manuscript before it's submitted, and any changes that are introduced in response to journal review comments. That's a critical component of, of publication. But each author is responsible for all data that's presented in any research communication, which they appear as an author. And that's, that's very important for investigators to understand. When you sign that agreement that you approve a draft of a, of a submission, you are vouching for the data that's in that paper. So you need to be sure as you're doing collaborative research uh, that you, carefully look at all of the data that's that's being generated and put into these papers. Okay, what qualifies an investigator to be included as an author? Um, the strictest interpretation of this is that if you're to earn authorship, you must contribute more than just simple technical assistance or reagents or molecular constructs. You have to contribute substantive ideas regarding the course of the project, uh, contributed to the experimental design of the research, or data analysis and interpretation, or contributed in a meaningful way to writing the research article. Very often, um, people expect to be 
put as authors, if they just supply a reagent or a molecular construct, that's not appropriate. Um, and for that reason, many investigators do take liberties with authorship issues. Um, and this is something that, that is a, an ethical responsibility for all of us to make sure that authors on our papers earn their authorship. Now, uh, a question, are unethical authorship practices an example of research misconduct? The answer is no, that doesn't constitute uh, research misconduct, but it is an ethical breach of, of a scientist. Okay. All right, what about research compliance? I wanna talk more about this too. So as you heard earlier, I've, I've been on the IBC, uh, at the chair of the IBC here for many years. Uh, and then I've also served on the um, IACUC. So I've, I've been involved in compliance for, for a long time. Um, so let's first talk about safe work practices. Investigators are, it's, it's an ethical responsibility for investigators to identify the risks associated with their work and to use research practices that mitigate those risks. Now, much of this is monitored by the Institutional Biosafety Committee or the IBC. If you're doing recombinant DNA work, the IBC is gonna be involved in that. Um, but it's, it's critical. This is an ethical responsibility of investigators to, to identify uh, the risks associated with their work and to mitigate those risks. Uh, is compliance with the IBC a research misconduct issue? Uh, the answer is no, it's not a, a breach of IBC or a non-compliance with IBC is not a research misconduct issue. Uh, IBC compliance is meant to protect investigators, the public and the environment from the risks of, associated with someone's research. Um, so it's not, it doesn't rise to the level of research misconduct, but it is a, an important ethical component uh, for a scientist. Animal subjects research. Uh, investigators have to submit protocols uh, before working with animals and have those protocols approved. Oversight for this is through the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee or the IACUC. And again, this is not a research misconduct issue when investigators are non-compliant with IACUC, but it is an ethical responsibility and there are important reasons for this. IACA compliance is meant to ensure humane and appropriate treatment and conditions for research animals, uh, as well as to protect the integrity of research findings for these in vivo studies. If you're working with animals and you're working with them in a way that uh, causes undue stress or pain and distress in those animals, that can have potentially an impact on the results, the experimental results of those studies. And so if you wanna do sound uh, in vivo research, you have to treat animals appropriately and the IACUC is there to help you uh, to do that. Human subjects research. Investigators must have approval from the Institutional Review Board before working with human subjects. And this is of paramount importance. Does this lack of compliance with IRB, is it a research misconduct issue? Sometimes it is, not always, but certainly sometimes it is. Um, RB compliance is there to protect human subjects um, during research. But many times, if, if an investigator is doing human subjects research and they publish that, that work, they're going to state in that paper that they had IRB approval to do the work. If they didn't have that approval, they have committed research misconduct by falsifying the, the record and stating that they do. And the other issue I think it's important for investigators to understand is that if you, if you do not have uh, IRB approval for your human subjects research, you cannot publish that data. And if it's found later after you've published it that you did not have approval to do the work, uh, the paper will have to be retracted. So it's important for investigators to understand those things. All right, now, why have I spent some time talking about these three things? Um, compliance with IBC, with the IACUC, and with the IRB, 
It typically does not result, you know, it's not a research misconduct issue, but what I can tell you in my experience as the Rio is that when investigators feel that these rules don't apply to them, they feel like no rules apply to them. And very often the people that, that we see that have compliance issues with these three entities, uh, they will also uh, end up committing research misconduct very often. And so there is a connection between these. And I think it's important for, for us all to understand that and to recognize that the rules apply to all of us. There's a reason for them. And people that are unable to follow these rules, typically uh, they feel like no rules apply to them. Okay, uh, data management and integrity. This is obviously probably the biggest area of research integrity that we could we could talk about. And let's we're going to talk about this more, but in the context of research misconduct. So, what constitutes research misconduct? Um, this is a strict definition. Uh, research misconduct means fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism in proposing, performing or reviewing research or in reporting research results. So fabrication is essentially making up data. Falsification is manipulating research materials, equipment or processes or changing or omitting data or results such that the research is not accurately represented in the research record. And it's important to, to focus on omitting, omitting data. That is a falsification and that is very often uh, at the root of research misconduct issues. Plagiarism is the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. Now, it's also important for everyone involved to understand that research misconduct does not include honest error or differences of opinion. So um, for, for an act to be research misconduct, it really, it has to be either knowing uh, falsification, fabrication, or plagiarism, or reckless fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism. So if you uh, should know that it's going on, but you're looking the other way, uh, you're being reckless, and, and that does constitute research misconduct. But honest error is not a research misconduct issue. Okay, requirements for findings of research misconduct. Um, there has to be a significant departure from accepted practices of the relevant research community. The misconduct has to be either intentional, knowing, or reckless, and the allegation must be proven by a preponderance of the evidence. And it's important for, for all research to understand what that means. You know, in a court of law, uh, if you're, con you're on trial for burglary, uh, there's a there's a threshold that's pretty high for finding you guilty of that. There has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. For research misconduct issues, there's all it requires is a preponderance of evidence. So if it's more likely than not that research misconduct occurred, then research misconduct occurred. And the way I've heard it described is 50% plus a feather. And so, you have to make sure that you are working ethically. If you uh, are, if when a person is alleged to have committed research misconduct, there's not a this really high level that you don't have to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. If it's more likely than not that it happened, then it happened, and that's that's important for everyone to understand. It's also important for you to understand really what research is and. I'm not going to read all of that to you. It, it covers pretty much everything you would do as a researcher. But I think what's really important here is, is thinking about the research record. Because uh, many people think the research record would include only uh, published work. And that's just simply not true. Research record means a record of data results that embody the facts resulting from scientific inquiry, including but not limited to, to research proposals, so grant applications, laboratory records, both physical and electronic, progress reports, abstracts, theses, oral presentations, internal reports, journal articles, and any documents and 
and materials provided to HHS. So essentially any record that you create that involves your research is that is part of the research record. So just because you haven't published a, a falsified piece of data, that does not mean if, if you have recorded it, uh, then you are guilty of research misconduct. Okay, so when these things occur, an inst institutional uh, evaluation of the research misconduct allegation has to take place. That starts with an with an inquiry, and if the inquiry panel determines that it's that it's an investigation is needed, then the university does an investigation. And there are several components to this that are really critical. Certainly, these panels very carefully document their findings. They ensure a fair investigation, um, do interviews with everybody that, that reasonably could have information related to this. And I think the most important thing on this slide is down at the bottom, pursuing leads. When an institutional investigation of research misconduct takes place, uh, the investigative panel diligently pursues all significant issues. So everything that the investigator has done now is under scrutiny, not just the alleged research misconduct. So all papers going back at least six years can be looked at. Um, and further, depending on whether they've, they've still been being referenced. And so uh, when, when an investigation takes place, everything that that investigator has done, every record they have on their computers and in their labs will be potentially looked at by the investigative panel. And so if they are doing unethical things, they are gonna be found. All right, and this is the definition of data fabrication. I'm not gonna read this to you. Basically creating data points is fabricating data. Uh, falsification is changing or omitting research results. And very often fabrication and falsification kind of are joined together because it's difficult to determine whether it's simply a, a falsification or a fabrication as well. But these are pretty easy to understand. Uh, plagiarism. I think most of us know what plagiarism is. But it's important for you to also know that directly copying your own words from one publication into another is also considered plagiarism. I think many investigators don't understand that you cannot plagiarize, plagiarize yourself any more than you can plagiarize someone else. All right, so let's look at some examples of the kinds of research misconduct that is found. Typically, the, the easiest uh, type of research misconduct to find is manipulation of, of images. This is what we see the most. And so in this particular slide, we see um, on the left is a previously published figure. And on the right, a new paper has come out and it's got this, this figure panel. Uh, and these are representing two completely different experimental conditions. But does anything look strange about this? Does this look familiar uh, to you? So these are two separate publications and these two micrographs uh, show they, they represent different experimental conditions. But if you take a clear look at the one on the right, if you flip it over horizontally and then flip it vertically and take a look at it, you'll see that, that this looks like the exact same micrograph. And if you blow that up, you can see that it clearly is the exact same micrograph. So this investigator has used the same image to represent two different experimental conditions. This is clearly fabrication of data. <clears throat> Here's another example of very similar. This is a, a previously published panel, which was a wild type condition. And here, this a paper in a, a, with a new submitted figure that is a completely different condition. And if you look, you don't have to look too carefully to see that that is an identical micrograph. It's just been blown up uh, to potentially misdirect. But these were caught during peer review. Um, and it's, I think it's important for investigators to understand that most journals now are actually using software that analyzes every figure that is 
uh, every photographic figure that is submitted to look for fabrication falsification. Uh, and so if you do this, you're very likely to get caught doing it. All right, here's an example that, that I think is, uh, is interesting. This is from a, a website called PubPeer. And this is a website that I think was initially uh, put up to be a place where people could talk about papers that research papers that really interested in, interested them. One thing that has become very popular on PubPeer is to post uh, questions about figures in papers. And so this is, this is a post by someone. They've said they have concerns about figure 1D and E, and they describe what the problems were. And let's look on the next page. I've blown this up so you can really see it. They've done pretty careful analysis of this and have determined every one of these that is boxed in red were actually derived from the same figure, the same lane. Uh, in some cases, they, they have been flipped horizontally. Um, in other cases, they've been scrunched. So this same exact image right here has been scrunched tighter to disguise it a little bit, but it's the exact same figure. If you stretch this out, it overlaps or overlays exactly with this. You can also see that they've identified uh, patches put in here uh, from various places. And you can recognize those patches because they have an identical uh, background in them. And so this, this figure, uh, these figures have been massively uh, fabricated and falsified. This is clearly a research misconduct, a case of research misconduct here. And so these, this pub here is a place where your competitors are there. If they look at your paper and they, they're going to be scrutinizing your work. And if they see something that looks strange like this, they're going to, it's going to be in the public domain. And eventually it's going to be found by, you know, it's going to be turn to the research integrity officer and there will be an investigation into research misconduct. All right, here's another example. You know, the image data is very easy to find. Uh, often it's very easy to find research misconduct or fabrication, falsification. It's a little more difficult with other types of data, but you'd be surprised how, uh, how carefully panelists will look at these. And in this case, this is just a spreadsheet and the panelists found uh, reused data throughout the spreadsheet. And so all types of records will be looked at carefully. This is a file when, when a research misconduct allegation is brought and, and an inquiry is started, the first stage of that will be to uh, confiscate all computers from the lab and make forensic copies of all hard drives. This was during an, in, an investigation. This was found on one of the computers that was, um, was confiscated from a lab. There is no purpose for this type of file other than to use it as a library for building figures. And so <laughs> you can see that this is something that, that people spend a good bit of time there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of people that are fabricating and falsifying data these days. All right, so let's think about the repercussions of research misconduct, um, because they're pretty vast. And what I'm going to show you here is really just a, a snapshot of this. It doesn't certainly encompass all of the repercussions. But if there's, if, if there's publication of falsified or fabricated data, uh, new experiments in that lab and in other labs that read this paper are going to be done based on those findings. Uh, and those new experiments uh, are, what's gonna happen? They're gonna, they're gonna fail. You're generating a, a line of investigation that's based on faulty foundation. Therefore, it's gonna result in a lack of progress. That certainly damages the career the careers of people that are doing this research that builds on that faulty foundation. It also results in resource waste, wasted resources, wasted research money. Um, and so, you know, that sounds, maybe it doesn't sound that great, but it is, this is 
ridiculous how bad how 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 hurtful this it's is to the research enterprise when this happens. <clears throat> this hurt all researchers and granting agencies. And, you know, so it's, it's a critical problem. Now, what else happens when, when falsified fabricated data is published? And if it is identified one by someone and an allegation of research misconduct is made, then there's an institutional inquiry and investigation. And if that identifies research misconduct, there are a lot more repercussions that take place. One, there certainly is an institutional resources are wasted. These panelists who are also researchers, usually their time that they could be spent spending doing research is now spent going through carefully through all of your research records to evaluate this research misconduct allegation. That's wasted time and effort on their part. Um, and again, this identifies wasted resources uh, and it hurts all researchers, but also if there's a finding of research misconduct, institutions sometimes are required to refund the grant dollars and those have already been spent. And so that is very hurtful to the university and it's hurtful to everyone that's doing research at that university. All right. Uh, if research misconduct is found, the paper is going to also have to be retracted. And let's think about what that, what the problems with that are. Certainly the person who committed the research misconduct, they deserve to have the paper retracted. But what about all the co-authors that had nothing to do with that? Uh, their reputations and CVs are damaged. They've, they've got a paper has been removed from their curriculum vitae. They've also now, you know, Oftentimes, it's not clear who committed the research misconduct. So everyone on that author list has their reputation sullied by this type of event. Um, and this damages their careers. It also results in a lack of progress. This, uh, they have gone down this road. They've built on these, these uh, bad data as they've participated in this project. And that results in a lack of progress for them. From, for them and injures their ability to get funded and to continue their research. So the repercussions for research misconduct are really vast. And um, I think, you know, it's important for people to understand just how, uh, how big of a problem this causes when it occurs. So it is a big problem and it's important for us to try to prevent research misconduct. How can we do that? I wish I had some real answers for you. Um, I've got some thoughts, I don't have any real answers. Uh, many feel that right now there is significantly more research misconduct occurring than ever before. It's a real epi epidemic and I wanted to say pandemic for obvious reasons, but I'll stick with epidemic on this. But why is this true? Why do you think there's more research misconduct going on right now than ever? And it's because, I, th I think largely because of extended low funding levels uh, from NIH and other granting agencies and desperate people do desperate things. And so there is a, we are in a, a time when it's really important to be vigilant about preventing research misconduct. Now, um, to solve these, this problem, we have to acknowledge the triggers. Uh, and principal investigators are one of those triggers. Low funding levels put pressure on PIs, no doubt about that. And how do PIs respond to that? Uh, most of them simply work harder and work more efficiently and better, uh, but there's a growing percentage that let that pressure impact their research ethics. You know, if, if a, a young investigator uh, needs to get tenure and he's not funded yet, that is a lot of pressure. And many investigators succumb to that pressure. They make up data that makes them more likely to get funded. Um, and that, that is a terrible result when that happens. So uh, what can this look like? Some PIs actively participate in research misconduct themselves. I think much more often, they put enormous pressure on students and especially on postdocs to generate the desired experimental results. Um, the, these people that work in their labs bring them data that, and the data does not 
uh, it does not fit with their um, theory of what would happen and that prevents the research from moving in the direction that really is best for that investigator. So the investigator encourages them to go back and try again until they get the result that is expected. And that is, uh, it's an awful uh, vicious cycle when that starts happening. Okay, postdocs and grad students are also some of the triggers. Uh, to stay in good graces of the PI, they succumb to the pressure and falsify and fabricate data. Some have not received effective training and don't fully understand research ethics. Um, I mean, everyone knows that you shouldn't be making up data. That You don't have to be taught that, that, that fabricating data is wrong. But some don't realize they can't plagiarize themselves, which is an act of research misconduct. And some don't understand that selective publication of data can amount to research misconduct. And so um, I think it's, it's really important that we train our students and postdocs uh, very carefully on these things. But the most dangerous term, I think, every time I hear it, it makes me cringe, is my experiment didn't work. And I hear uh, PIs telling students this all the time, your experiment didn't work. You need to go back and figure out how to make it work. Most of the time, the experiment did work. The result just was not the one that fit with the, with the theories and uh, that drive the work where the investigator would really like for it to go. And so, you know, it, every time I hear a student say my experiment didn't work, it, it worries me that they're going to go back and change conditions trying to generate the finding that the PI really wants them to have. Um, now, I think most postdocs and grad students are have an ethical center and, and they are driven to do this by being pressured. Uh, but some are just simply unethical people. There are some unethical people that will do whatever it takes to make them seem successful. And it's hard to, it's hard to do anything about those people. But, but the people that have an ethical center, uh, good training really can probably help prevent this from going on. Now, so what are the possible solutions to this? When it comes to principal investigators, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say some things here that probably will upset some people. But I think principal investigators are, are a real key to this. I think maybe annual or semi-annual research ethics training for PIs uh, should be considered. Research ethics training as an orientation requirement for, for all new faculty, absolutely that should be done. There's no question in my mind about that. Encourage or require PIs to use plagiarism detection software prior to submission of any research paper for publication or grant application. Um, the library, I, I believe, has this software. And so this is something that could easily be done. Set mentorship expectations for PIs. Require PIs to involve students in the compliance process. Not do the compliance process for the PI, but be involved in it and to understand what is required, how those things are, how those protocols are written and why they're important. I think that is really important for all trainees to understand because when they become a PI themselves, they are going to have to deal with the IBC, the IACUC, and or the IRB. Um, require PIs to provide annual training for lab personnel related to research ethics. I think that would is something that should be considered. Of course, I think the training materials would meet, need to be provided to the PI, but that's not a difficult thing to do. Um, oversight of PI interactions with grad students and postdocs. I'm not certain what this might look like, but you know, very often, I, I don't know how many times I've heard about research mentors who put multiple postdocs on the same project and basically tell them the one of you that brings, that drives this project forward is going to get to stay. The other one is not going to be here six months from now. You hear that all the time. And what is, what is that process? When, when someone does that, they are encouraging, uh, I think, or they're certainly putting pressure on people to do things that they shouldn't do. Uh, so I'm not sure what this must, might look like, but certainly 
when those types of things are known, there should be some intervention to prevent that from happening. Um, and this is just my opinion. I think most research misconduct is precipitated by principal investigators. It might not be perpetrated by them, but it is precipitated by the pressure that they put on postdocs and grad students and primarily postdocs. Grad students have, have research committees that can that make this more difficult. Postdocs don't. And so postdocs are really the primary target for this kind of thing in, in many cases. Okay, possible solutions relating to postdocs and grad students. Um, again, I think research ethics training as an orientation requirement for all new postdocs and students is, is critical. I know that, that our students and postdocs do take the research ethics course that's taught here. But often they, they're not taking that until they've been here for a while. It might be really good to have uh, some training when they are oriented, when they come in here and start at UT. Teach them what constitutes research misconduct, orient them on methods used by journals to identify research misconduct, um, orient them on websites such as PubPeer where competitors are, com are carefully reviewing their work educate them on the repercussions of research misconduct findings on their research career. Um, you know, if nothing else, scare them straight. Um, orientation of grad student dissertation committees. Maybe it would be nice to have, uh, make oversight of PI interactions with grad students a point of emphasis for these committees um, and have all of the members other than the PI meet with the student periodically to assess what kind of pressures the PI is putting on that student. Um, I don't know exactly what this might look like, but it's something that might be effective. Uh, mentorship committee for postdocs. You know, students have mentorship committees. They, uh, not mentorship committees, but, but dissertation committees. Uh, postdocs don't have that. Maybe, um, maybe they should have a mentorship committee that can oversee the interactions between the PI and those, postdoc, those postdocs. Again, these are maybe extreme measures, and I don't know if they would ever be considered, but I think they should at least be uh, fleshed out a little bit. Okay, so conclusions. Uh, research ethics encompasses many essential aspects of research. Um, we've talked about compliance with the IBC, IACUC, IRB, publication ethics, mentoring, collaboration ethics, and paramount integrity of the research record. Research misconduct is intentional falsification, fabrication of data and or plagiarism. Incidence of this is on the rise and is likely higher than it's ever been right now. Research misconduct has many negative impacts on research that damage all of us as researchers and as, an inst as, and as institutions. Prevention of research misconduct is largely dependent on effective training and mentorship. And this includes faculty, postdocs, graduate students, and other lab members. And I didn't really mention that before, but, uh, but everyone working in a lab should understand these things. Okay, and so I will now take questions if there are any. Okay, um, thank you so much, Dr. Miller. That was very informative. Um, first one is how should persons report research misconduct in their institutions? Um, they should contact the research integrity officer. So usually is there a confidential method? Um, how, how would you protect that person's privacy? Yeah, okay. So um, it's possible to do that in a uh, private way, but one thing's for sure, your identity will not be shared with anyone except for the respondent. And there are very strict rules that prevent the respondent from, uh, from doing anything negative toward, the, toward a complainant in one of these cases. And those, those rules are taken very seriously by the institution. And so if a respondent uh, retaliates in any way against someone who, complain, who makes one of these complaints, uh, they will be dealt with in very serious terms by the university. So, uh, and these research misconduct uh, proceedings are very, it's critical that they be um, kept very quiet. No one knows anything about these cases except the, the panelists and the, 
the complainant, any witnesses that are interviewed, and the respondent. Confidentiality so, is really critical to protect everyone's uh, reputations during these during these proceedings. So there are a lot of people representing all kinds of institutions here, but specifically at UT, is would they contact you? Mm -hmm. They would send you an email or yeah. phone call or phone call, email, yeah. Any any what letter, snail mail, it doesn't matter how it how it is sent, but um and if if I receive one of those, I do an assessment um of, of the situation and um and then if if that assessment indicates that there's there's uh, are legs to this, then I see an inquiry panel to look into it. So would you break down that assessment or how you would dissect and what questions you would ask? <clears throat> well, it depends. That's so case dependent. But um, the bottom line is that when when an assessment is done, basically what what my level is on that is to know I, I need to know if or I've got to decide whether the uh, the complaint is a legitimate complaint if you know um, and whether it's specific enough if first off does the does the complaint that's made uh, does if it's true does it meet the definition of research misconduct so that's that's the first step does it meet the definition of research misconduct if it doesn't if it's true uh, if it doesn't meet the definition of research misconduct that's where it stops okay but if if what is being accused does meet the definition of research misconduct uh, then that that is the first stage the other is whether the allegation is specific enough and whether it's credible and that the credible level doesn't have to be very high. It's not, uh, I don't do an investigation to determine how credible it is, but if it's specific and the person uh, could know whether this had gone on or not, then those two, those two questions, once they are answered in the affirmative, then I see an investigative panel to make this same determination. Uh, they look at the same things and they're trying to answer those same two questions. If they come up with the same answer that I did, then it goes to an investigation. And the investigative panel is the one that really does the deep dive into everything that's everything that that researcher has done. Okay, um, next question is, can you talk about the sanctions imposed for research misconduct and how that would affect their current job and then future career potential? Um, well, you know, that's, um, I've been the Rio now for three years. Um, I've had, I had five cases this year, and I can tell you that in some cases, it results in someone losing their position. Uh, in others, it might be that they're on probation for two years or there's over an oversight committee has to look at everything they do for some period of time. It ranges from uh, relatively minor uh, to very serious uh, repercussions, but um, it depends on the seriousness of the research misconduct. Uh, it depends on how much you know, has this person committed many acts of research misconduct, then it becomes a bigger issue. If it's, uh, you know, more limited or it's maybe not, uh, you know, it wasn't falsification uh, in an actual paper, but it was research records, well, then that's not deemed probably as serious. And so it depends. There's a big range on, on the answer to that question. There's, there's a big range. Okay. Um, another question has come in that um, is uh, associated with this is, is there a time frame in which you need to report an allegation? Um, no, but, you know, one thing that I would say is that it's, it's all of us from all researchers and scientists, it is our duty, really, to, to, uh, to report anything that we think could be research misconduct. As a scientist, it is your duty to do that. Um, and you should do it as soon as you, 
as soon as you uh, identify the problem. It's also important to note that, that the complainant should not investigate these things. If, if they have a, a reasonable a belief that research misconduct is going on, they should report it. They should not try to investigate it. Um, here's another question. You might think, or people might think that collaboration with others might mean more transparency, hence maybe a preventive measure to uh, for research misconduct. Do you believe that, or do you have any thoughts about that? Well, um, you know, collaboration, it depends on how close the collaborators are. And uh, when you're working with, with people from different institutions, it's um, as much as you might try to have it be a very transparent process, it's, it's more difficult for it to be transparent than if you're all working, you know, if you're on the same floor of a building and you're working together, there's, there's going to be more transparency. I, again, I think this is a there's a, a great range of how this goes. Um, and it also depends on the, the relationship between the collaborators, whether they are uh, true collaborators or whether they are uh, collaborators that are also uh, in competition between each other. You know, there's, it, again, there's, this is all over the map as to how these, these relationships work. But the most important part about it is to make sure that the communication is very clear between those groups and having things in writing is really important. You know, if you, you talk about authorship issues, um, it's best to have that those kind of decisions made in writing before you start if you can so that there are no uh, disputes at the end that um, that become he said she said kinds of things. So if, if I was collaborating with someone else and they were accused of research or they were, excuse me, they were found to be involved in research misconduct, would that affect me? Um, well, the, the effects it has on you, if you are a co-author on the paper, it's gonna affect you if that paper is retracted, certainly, because that paper comes off of your resume. Uh, that research, time and effort that you spent doing that research is now wasted. Uh, so it has a, a, you know, indirectly, it has a really big impact on some people. It depends on how involved they were in the work, how much time they spent on it, and how much it delays their progress uh, as a researcher. So it certainly is going to impact you. However, if, you know, from a reputation point of view, hopefully it won't. Um, our desire, I think, is always to, if, if a paper is being retracted because of a research misconduct finding, the perpetrator, if possible, it's, it's important to, to have the person who was found guilty of that identified in that retraction so that the other authors are not, um, you know, there's no uh, question about who actually committed the research misconduct. What's not clear to me at this point, I'm still fairly new in this in this role, you know, because of confidentiality issues, how easy is that to, to make happen? And it's not clear to me, I still haven't learned enough about that at this point. Um, here's another question. What are some suggestions to create an environment of sharing allegations or suspicions? Well, I, I think the most important thing is, is training and to, to have all investigators know and to, to embrace the idea that it really is your responsibility to, uh, as a researcher, to, to identify these things and to report them if you see them. Because um, the impacts are of, of research misconduct are so vast and they can impact so many people. Um, I'll give you an example. In one of my recent cases, there was a, a paper from many years ago that that was that became involved in this and it became clear that that paper had falsified data in it there had been literally hundreds of different researchers had used had had used that research as the part of the foundation for the work they were doing um, that's you know it's uh, 
it's disgraceful when you think through just how much time and effort and money was wasted uh, on this falsified data. It's devastating, really, to the research to the research world when that happens. And so if, if we can all embrace the idea that that is just absolutely unacceptable, uh, it makes it easier, I think, for us to report it when we see it. And I don't think anybody enjoys reporting these things. Uh, none of us want to see uh, our colleagues lose their jobs and things like that. But if you, if you uh, do this in good faith, um, and if they didn't do it, it will be found out. The investigative panels are very, are very good at this. And, and you know, I, I told you that it's preponderance of the evidence, but I think in most cases, uh, investigative panels want that level to be a little higher than that, because these are colleagues of theirs that work at their institution. They don't, they don't uh, enjoy the idea of finding them, them guilty of research misconduct. But if, if it's clear that they did it, they will do so because they know just how important this is to the research enterprise. Um, other than potential loss of the job and career um, inabilities down the, down the road, are there any financial punitive um, sanctions placed on a person? Not that I've ever heard of. Um, no, I don't think I've ever heard of any fines being instituted but certainly uh, if you've trained your whole life to be a researcher and um, now you can no longer get a research job that is going to have a financial impact uh, in the end um, and not every finding of research misconduct is going to cause somebody to lose their job and then to not be able to get another job but there are some that are severe enough that that can happen so uh, indirect financial um, financial uh, penalties do occur, but nothing direct. I've never heard of any direct fine being given. Okay. But remember, I'm, I'm only, uh, I've only seen a, a couple of cases go to completion, so I, I can't really answer that with great aplomb. One last question is, what can you do if you, rep if you report misconduct and it doesn't get the attention that it should? Oh, I can guarantee you it will. Um, it will get the attention it deserves. If, if research misconduct is alleged, uh, there will be, um, there will certainly be a institutional proceeding to look into it, for sure. I mean, you, yeah. you can speak for UT, but what if this occurred at another facility? Oh, well, I mean, I, th I think, you know, on balance, most places, I'm sure, take these things very seriously. Because in the end, um, if any PHS funding is involved in this, uh, the Office of Research Integrity at, at PHH, PHS is also looking at all of these cases. Once an allegation is made, uh, they, are, they have to be notified of it, and they are going to look at our uh, investigation and and make sure that we've come to the correct conclusion. And so there's oversight of institutions on how they deal with research misconduct issues. And if we don't do that in a proper way, um, we can lose the ability to have PHS funding here at this university. So I think all, all institutions recognize the importance of this process because they can actually lose the ability to have NIH funding or other PHS uh, funding agencies. And so um, I, I think most, most institutions recognize how important this is. Okay, thank you, Dr. Miller. I'm gonna turn this over to Dorita right now. Dr. Miller and Margaret, and I thank you for presenting this topic to us today. Um, you've definitely given us a wealth of information regarding um, scientific integrity and how we can prevent research misconduct. Um, we appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. And we know that definitely this um, information will keep us, help us to keep us out of trouble. Um, and again, thank you for presenting um, for Research 103. All right, you're uh, very welcome. I thank you. Has a great afternoon. Sure. Um, Margaret and I now would like to thank everyone for attending today's session. Um, as Margaret said earlier, this is our last one for Research 103. 
But um, we would like, now like to invite you to attend our next training session, which will be um, our PI, our Principal Investigator Series, which will start May the 4th and go through June the 3rd. You do not have to be a PI to attend. Um, and some of the topics that will be presented in that series will be finding funding and research opportunities, study design, um, blind income, founding events, sample size and power, um, developing and following a protocol, um, topics also planning budgets and contracts, responsible um, conduct of research, which will be given by Dr. Sandy Arnold, um, which will um, have a different perspective, subject recruitment and retention. Um, and Margaret um, will, I'm sure she has already sent out a lot of information about this PI series. And we thank you um, as always for attending and wish everyone a good rest of your day. Thanks.